All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Sebastian, and this is Principles of Risk Management, the Option Pit Method. And before I begin, I'd like to uh, lay out that this is for educational purposes only. None of this should be construed as financial advice. Uh, if you options have risk, and if you have questions or you're interested in anything you hear, consult your financial professional. Uh, long story short, if you listen to here and then lose and then somehow lose money, it is your own dumb fault, not ours. So, with that said, let's uh, let's talk about a couple of things now. Before before I talk about what we're going to discuss, why don't I talk about myself? Now, most of you probably know who I am. Uh, my name is Mark Sebastian. I founded Option Pit. Uh, Option Pit is a full service education and consulting company. We work with large hedge funds and money management groups, helping them implement, manage, and, uh, and stress test their strategies. And then we, uh, so, you know, I, you're a money manager and you're interested in, learn, in developing an option overlay strategy. We work with that type of, uh, of person. Then, uh, on the retail side, we work with individual traders, teaching them the approach that we got taught as traders. So it's kind of the retail version of the market making approach, which starts with risk and knowledge. And then, uh, you know, and so I like to say that we've worked with clients from uh, 15, 100 to 15 billion. And sadly, the people with 1,500 bucks are uh, probably no more most of the time. Uh, in addition, I also run a small hedge fund called Carmen Line Capital with Andrew, who's my COO as the head of risk. Uh, and uh, you may see me floating about on TV as, uh, you know, the only thing I like more than, teach, than teaching options is hearing the sound of my own voice. So with that, let's talk about what we're going to discuss. What is risk management? Yeah, I do. I have a show on CBOE TV called Track the Trade. That's actually a part of Option Pit. But if you go to trackthetrade.com, you can see all of my shows. Uh, and I like to, and you can kind of see some of my logic when I'm developing a trade. So uh, what we're going to discuss is what is risk management. I'm going to talk about a money management plan or the money plan. I'm going to talk about the trading plan. I'm going to talk about position management basics. I'm going to talk about looking for conditions and the option pit method. All right. Um, so there you have it. Yeah, sometime in the spring, I'm uh, I'm actually going to be up in Canada. I'm supposed to co-host the morning hour on BNN television. So. If you're a Canadian, you may see me for an extended period of time one morning. All right, so what is risk management? And I, I Googled it in the Merriam, uh, the Merriam Webster Dictionary. And, um, you know, it said, the word you've entered isn't in the dictionary. Click on spelling suggestions. All right, now, probably because it's two words, part, part of the problem. But really, risk management is a lot of things to a lot of people. Uh, when I was in a fraternity, we had a risk manager. And basically his job was to make sure that the campus police didn't arrest everybody at a party we were throwing. Uh, a risk manager, when I was a floor trader, their job was to uh, constantly frustrate me, it felt like sometimes. But really, their job was to protect their owner's money. All right? And so let me talk about what I think it means for you guys, the retail traders and institutional. All right. So it's taking of risk in the most capital efficient manner as such to receive the highest possible return for the fewest amount of dollars at risk. Call it risk adjusted analysis. If you're doing really good risk adjusted return analysis, you are a risk manager. All right. In addition, it's also dollar allocation, which I'm going to talk about. So how do you do that? And the key is trade structure, risk management, and efficient use of capital. Right? Those are kind of the pillars of option pit, if you will. Trade structure, risk management, 
and efficient efficiency of capital. All right. Now, before flying a plane, all right, my uh, my wife's cousin. All right, actually, I know probably a few pilots here. Anybody here an airline pilot or a uh, a pilot of any kind? All right. So we got a, name, a guy named Randy who's a pilot. All right. Now, Randy, how much classroom work did you have to do before they let you start? But yeah, former pilot. Jerome's former pilot. So guys that are pilots, how much classroom work did you have to do before you even sat behind a simulator? You know, what did you have to know? There you go. Yeah, I see. I see lots. I see lots. All right, weeks to months is the other one. Now, why? Why? Well, you know, the key is, and this is the first trader a lot of a lot of people make, is that pilots need to intuitively understand how the plane works because it makes understanding what the plane is doing so much easier. All right, and how the plane works when you're actually flying them. All right, so it, it allows them. By understanding intuitively why the plane can fly and what controls the flight, it allows for them then behind the controls to more intuitively fly the plane itself. And that is the key. All right. That is the key. And, and, uh, and trading is the same way. And this is the first mistake a lot of traders make. All right. Understanding the instrument is the basis of risk management. All right, and these are some very basic stuff that everybody should know. All right, and then I'll talk about me learning a trade here. So how is an option different from an, an equity? How is one option position different from another? Can you, have you learned the workings of the instrument intuitively? And what does that mean? All right, so do you understand the basics? This is option fluency. You need to be fluent in options in order to trade. Do you understand the basics? Quote, expiry, synthetics. All right. Do you understand how the option pricing model works? The option pricing model is to option trading as the wing is to lift and drag on an airplane. Do you understand how the Greeks function as an output of the pricing model? All right, and what are the non-modeled risks? Right, like a pilot's flying and everything works well and everything works the way they should. There's still pe things like unexpected turbulence that a pilot needs to be prepared for that aren't exactly modeled in in, in the design of an airplane. All right, so these are the pieces that a trader needs to understand before trading. And this is the key. I meet a lot of people that say, I want to make money now. I want to make money now. How does this make me money? How does this make me money? And I can tell you, people that say, how does this make me money, and that don't know their basic theory, and don't know the, and aren't fluent in options, uh, what they end up doing is giving people like me a lot of money. All right? Risk graphs are nice, but they are built on the model. All right? If you don't understand how the model works, you can't accurately manage risk. All right? So there are shortcuts that you can learn. But at the beginning, learn how options work up and down, inside and out. All right. So under, and this is really why, understanding the cause of risk is the key to managing risk. When I was a trader, all right, and here's a chart from LiveVol, and you can see how risk changes with time and with volatility. 
when I was a when I was be getting trained, all right, I spent almost a year trading before my bosses would let me on a badge to trade their money. Why? Why did my bosses make me go through months of classroom, months and months of classroom, months and months of mock trading, and then months of trading next to somebody who, who was already on a badge? Why? Yeah, they wanted, well, risk management. Yeah, they wanted to make sure that I was fully prepared to trade. And the first way for them to make sure I was fully prepared to trade is to make sure at a minimum I knew everything. Because I was going to trade their money. All right, now, I had the benefit of trading somebody else's money when I started. Now, how many of you are trading your money? Yeah, they were controlling their risk. How many of you are trading other people's money? And how many, are, or are most of you trading your own? Yeah, you're all almost all trading your own, right? Okay. Now, now here's my question for you. All right. Have you put yourself through the same – my wife's. <laughs> That's funny. Have you put yourself to the same standard as you would if you were giving your money to somebody else? Have you put yourself to the same standard as you would somebody else? A lot of people might say higher. Yeah, some say more, some say less, some say the same. All right, but it's an important way to think of it. You know, the peop I've seen tons and tons of people. Well, Edward Jones isn't isn't the same. But if you were hiring a hedge fund manager, like if you were hiring me. Okay. All right. So, so this is the key. All right. So now let's talk about all the pieces of it. All right. So understand what you're trading. All right. What are the dollars at risk? And I've seen people do this. This is crazy. What does it multiply? What is its multiplier? What does it expire into? When does it expire? Sounds simple, but is it? It's not. Think about there's SPY, there's SP, there's about 19 different ways to trade the S&P 500. There's all sorts of different ways to trade oil. You need, if you're going to trade something, you better understand it inside and out. All right. And so when you are starting a trade and if you want to manage your risk, pillar number one. Understand options or futures or anything inside and out. All right, so now let's talk about money management. And this is the next key. Once the trader is actually ready to trade, so once you've built your foundation, all right, the next step is to build a money management plan. A money management plan will allow for how much of an account will be engaged in the market and how much of that money is allocated as it's engaged. That's a good question. So how do you know that you have enough info? All right. That's a great question. Well, here be what I would say is if you can put a, a, a position on, a relatively complex position on, 
and know where your where your risks are without looking at a risk graph or a risk chart or risk slides then you're there so you should be able to walk away from your computer have, let's pretend let's pretend that you had an assistant all right you put on a, a couple of uh, you put on a, a couple of trades the market starts to move your assistant calls you and says hey this is going on and you can successfully and accurately give your assistant instructions without looking at a computer does that make sense All right. So, and and really, the money management plan is as much part of that as as. Uh, so now that you've got your knowledge and understanding, all right. Now that you understand how much knowledge you need, all right, you got to have a money management plan, and that will allow for how much of your account you're trading at any given time. And how much of that is allocated as it's engaged? So the money management. What kind of money do you have to work with? What is the goal rate of return? How can you allocate capital so that you are able to achieve that rate of return? Can this be done without the risk of blowing up your account? Is the plan efficient and does the plan scale? These are the steps that you need to take in your risk management plan, your money management plan. So capital. Now, different accounts warrant different approaches to trading, but do not treat any capital lightly. All right. I had somebody just now say they blew 12000 bucks. That's that stinks before they learned that they had to learn something. So what I want to stress at the beginning is there's no such thing as throwaway capital. Treat every dollar as it matter as if it matters. Even if you've got five million bucks in your in your back pocket. All right. Don't ever say anything like it's a six thousand dollar account. Who cares? Because if you're undisciplined on the small things, and this is one of the things that, they, that my boss has always stressed. If you're undisciplined on the small things, you'll be undisciplined on the big things. It will leak through. Anybody here a, a military person? Anybody here ex-military or in the military? All right. So... When you're going to officer camp or boot camp or whatever, you know, what is what does your your cot have to look like when you uh, when you leave when when you're uh, getting when you're done getting up and you know getting out to to go do PT? Yeah, you have to bounce a, be able to bounce a coin off your cot, and why? All right. Do you, do you think the do you think when you're when you're out on on patrol that your your platoon leader gives two two bits about whether your uh, your uniforms all is ironed and whether your your uh, sleeping bags put away pop, for properly? No. But it's all about discipline. That's correct. It is all about Discipline, discipline, discipline. All right, and that's the same thing with a small account. If you can't be disciplined with a, a small account, you're not going to be disciplined with a big account. So let's talk about some things that cost six thousand dollars that anybody might want. Attention to detail is key. So if rather than I would encourage you to do one of the following, rather than Blow six thousand dollars in a trading account. You could buy this really cool looking drone. Like how cool looking is that thing? I mean, seriously, that is a crazy heavy lift drone. 
You can carry things. You know, you could deliver packages for Amazon on that thing. All right? Or if you're a classic car aficionado, why not this beautiful 1974 Dodge Dart Swinger? Runs like a dream. That could be yours for less than 6000 bucks. Or hey, maybe you're more into style. All right? Maybe Maybe you're about five, maybe you're a, a, a female or male who's uh, you know five foot two and wants wants to look very tall and and uh, and and good in a in a pair of, of ultra high heels. Well, have I got the pair of Christian Louboutins for you? It's all about the red soul, ladies and gentlemen. All of these can be yours for less than six thousand dollars. All right. So I would encourage you, if you're not going to pay attention to your small account, don't bother and go buy one of, go buy one of these things or something else that interests you. All right? So, and you're saying, who in the world would want a pair of $5,900 Christian Louboutins? Uh, she is currently uh, upstairs in my bedroom reading a book right now and relaxing so uh, there you have it so not saying she's got a pair because she doesn't I mean of six thousand dollars shoes so <laughs> hey she's awesome so uh, there you have it and she's at, she actually would never wear a heel that tall because she's about five foot nine. So I don't have the drone. Oop. I don't have the drone either. So <laughs> how did you learn discipline? Uh, in trading, it was the same way. I had to do, I was a clerk. <laughs> I was a clerk for about a year and I had to do all these little things in perfect detail. And that was the key. I mean, I'm like borderline ADD and I was able to learn attention to detail and at least in the terms of trading. So think about that. Think about that. All right, hey. So, so let's keep going. So now let's talk about, and this is actually the trap that gets most people, all right? Let's talk about what is a realistic rate of return on your capital, all right? Be aware of what is realistic, all right? Is a 5% a month return on all of your capital, realistic. All right, so I, I've got a hundred thousand dollar account. I'm going to make five percent a month trading it. Compounded, that equates to over eighty percent a year. Now, what percentage of retail trader do you think makes eighty percent a year? I would venture to say it's far less than 1%. I bet you it's about a half a percent. No, no one's telling the truth. Now, there's a whole lot of liars. All right, now, what you will see, there's a lot of these guys that'll sit there and say, oh, look at this butterfly that I tr did. I can get t a 10% return on that. And they do a 10 lot butterfly and they make 10%. So they make $1,500 on a $15,000 butterfly and you go and they're like, oh, I made 10%. Well, what they leave out is that that's on a $100,000 account and really they made one and a half percent. And that throws out the concept that they lose. Is a 2% a return realistic? Yes, that's far more, on average, that is far more realistic. Now, even so, 
you know, like I said, my, I run a fund. I'm gunning for 20 to 30 percent on my fund. Net of fees. All right. So it is realistic, but how many retail traders do you think do 26% a year on their account after, after they're done paying all their commissions and stuff? Uh, I'm going to say about 2% or less. So the key is be realistic. Don't, there are so many guys out there that are just flat out liars. Flat out liars. All right. And so the key is having the right expectations and that will help you avoid making silly mistakes. If you're not gunning for 100%, you're less likely to get yourself caught. Now let's talk about allocating capital. All right. So how much of an account should stay in cash? All right. At any given time, all right, at any given time, on a, on a cash account or a reg T, I, I would typically keep 40 to 50% of my dollars in cash as a retail trader. All right. What is the target return on traded capital to achieve the trader's goal rate of return? All right. So if you're trying to make 2% a month and you're on a $100,000 account and you're only trading $50,000 a month, what do you actually need to make on your actual capital that you're putting at risk? Four percent. All right, so Satyrus Paribus, if you've got a whole host of trades, Satyrus Paribus, how should capital be allocated across trades in your trading plan? All right, and it's going to assume, and you know, so when I start, I assume every trade is going to do about the same, and then as conditions change, this is called conditional trading, the way I allocate changes. Risk of blow up. All right. When allocating comp capital, one common mistake is the too much of a good thing approach. You need to be diversified. Be aware of the risks of long and short premium. I love when people say I'm an income trader. You ever heard anybody say, oh, I'm an income trader? I'm an income trader I'm trying to make income. Well, do you think the guy buying, buying, buying stuff from you doesn't want to make an income? You think straddle buyers and strangle buyers don't make an income? All right. Everybody's an income trader. But be aware of the risk of being short too much premium or long too much premium. Be aware of the maximum loss in a catastrophe. All right. So... I think we had an example of this in August, right? That was a straight up catastrophe. What was the true maximum loss for traders there? Then take appropriate steps to make sure one is always able to trade. You're always able to trade. So what does that mean? It means if everything goes wrong, you do everything wrong, everything, right? If you did everything wrong, will you be able to trade tomorrow? 
and the you should always the answer should always be yes. And we got kind of mopes did not know what their loss ability was. Right, and that starts if you didn't know how much you could lose, given an August scenario, and you're not testing for that, then you need to go back to when I was talking about fundamentals and risk, about understanding your fundamentals of options. I mean, there's an off chance Monday could be really bad, folks. You realize that, right? Doesn't feel like it will. But it's there. You mean I can lose everything in a massive credit spread mishap? Uh, yeah, that, that can happen. And that's why you shouldn't just be, that's why you shouldn't just be a big, huge, short a ton of credit spreads. You know, there was a mutual fund uh, that started in kind of the end of 2011, kind of as the, all that stuff was going, as that thing was, was doing well. And all they did was sell credit spreads. And they made money for years and years and years. And then in August, they blew over 30% of the funds under management in two days. So if you were a customer and over the four years you were there, you made, let's say, a, you know, a total of a 50% return. Watch this. So over those four years, let's say at 100,000 bucks, and, and, and it became 150,000 over those four years. So now, they blew, 30, they blew over 30%. So let's say it was, we'll just say 32%. They lost 48,000 bucks on that $150,000 account. So guess what just happened to all the money you made in those four years? Gone. All right, and now never be short units. You know, I used to say that you need to be net long. I've changed. You know, I'm more of now a believer in dynamic crisis hedging than I am in straight up always being hedged. <laughs> but it's a five standard deviation event. It won't happen for another 158 years or next Monday. Yeah, that's the big thing is multi-standard deviations events tend to group together. All right. So units are inexpensive options that are at the outsides of where the model prices itself efficiently. All right. In SPX, a unit might be $2.50 or under or below a 2 or 3 delta. It's in SPY, it's going to be below $0.20, cents, and in lower names, it's going to be 10 so don't be short these. What does that mean? Well, if you have on put spreads or call spreads and those spreads are now worth less than 20 cents in SPY or less than two bucks in SPX, you know, the options within them are worth less than that, it's time to close, all right? So as your spreads become worth let's say less than a quarter in any valuable stock, cover them. Cover them. You know, I've seen, you know, statistically, if I sit there and sell 10 cent options over and over and over again, and I have a bottomless pit of money, I will end up making money. However, I don't know anybody that's a bottomless pit of money and the risk of blowout associated with these is so high, and they net add so little to your account when all is said and done, that if you are not covering these stuff, you are asking to get punched in the stomach. 
Not by me, but by other people. So now let's talk about evaluating the plan. All right, so once you've decided, all right, once you've decided, all right, once you decide the money management plan is in place, make sure to evaluate the plan after its completion. Is there too much concentration on one short premium trade or another? What is your net Vega exposure? All right. Use the 1% theta rule for simplicity. All right. Now, what's the 1% theta rule you're going to ask? Well, I mean, do you really want a position that where the theta is returning more than – if you're in a, in a big theta position and it's returning kind of more than – 1% of your total risk on a, a day or 1% of your cash a day, you've got too much on. So if I, you got a $100,000 account and your theta is 1000 bucks, you have too much risk on. Do you have enough long realized exposure? Do you have long gamma in your portfolio? Is there enough cash? And if you need insurance, do you have it? All right, so you don't need insurance if you're going to do things like condors. You can do crisis hedging. But if you're a short strangle trader, by all means, you better, own a, you better be a net owner of cheap, cheap, cheap puts. Tom, Tom and, uh, you know, there's this Tasty Trade show where they love rolling out Karen the Super Trader. And, you know, all she does is short strangles all the time. She got clipped like you wouldn't believe in August. And I'm guessing she's getting clipped now. And that is why you should always be a net owner of puts. Even if you're only paying a nickel for them. You know, let me show you. I mean, so let me show you on a professional level. So this is my... Uh, this is how I communicate with floor brokers when I'm trading. All right. And I want to show you a couple of trades that went up. The SPX Jan, these expire next Friday. Broker paid 15 cents on 2,000 of them. You know, and uh, at 20,000, excuse me. And there was a 10,000 lot that paid that where they bought 10 cents for the 1,400s. Yeah, here, 10,000 paying 15. And then here's another 11,000 of the 1410s where they paid a dime. It's all unit protection. So do you have enough cash and do you have protection if you need it? All right, now this is a big one where people screw up. Is the plan scalable? A real trading approach should be planned on $200,000, not $20,000. How far out in time do you need to buy cheapy puts? Well, you don't unless, unless you've got some naked exposure somewhere else. So if you're naked short strangles, buy some cheapy puts in the SPX uh, with a similar duration. If it doesn't, and this is the key, if it doesn't scale, it doesn't work. So if you're trading a $25,000 account, ask yourself, if this was $2.5 million, would I trade it the same way? If the answer is no, then you need to change your approach. All right, so now let's talk about the trading plan. 
And this, the nitty gritty of our capital allocation, it assumes all trades are in tradable but not spectacular conditions. It can allocate across your trading plan, and then you adjust the sizes of your trades according to the conditions. And it puts in place restrictions on losses and target gains, covers adjustment strategies and insurance, if you want it. So finally, adjust allocation according to what trades are more or less favorable. Find edge. If a certain trade sucks, don't trade it. And if a certain trade is great, then do more of them in small size. And remember, cash is a position. So now, the trade plan. What is the most important part of managing the risk of trades? And that's picking good trades. Picking good trades makes risk management much easier. This is a good question. Isn't it easier to diversify with 200000 than 20000 No. You know, if you're trading $20,000, you should just be putting on smaller trades. They should be trade, traded exactly the same. You have no idea how often I've seen people trade 20000 bucks. And they go to their uncle and say, hey, look how well I've done on 20000 bucks." And then the uncle gives them a couple hundred thousand dollars to trade, and the person is paralyzed. You need to have the same approach. If it doesn't scale, it doesn't work. All right, now, things to remember. Good trades make risk management easy. So how does one enter good trades? And this goes circles back to the beginning. Take the time to understand what are the best conditions for each trade. Remember we talked about that foundation, that ability to visualize the trade. Well, that ability to visualize the trade is also the ability that's going to help you pick the best trade and also build and and make the best closing and adjustment plan plan all right so keys to a trade plan write up the optimal conditions for each trade all right what are optimal normal and no trade conditions for an iron condor or a butterfly or whatever in your trade plan all right then write up an adjustment plan for any pot potential conceivable move. So the underlying rallies in IV is down and falling. The underlying rallies in IV is up and rising. Underlying falls, IV is up but falling. All these different combinations of the underlying movement and the implied volatility. So what is a good condition? Well, this is the SPX. This is August. All right. And so the question is, what is a good condition? And one thing I can tell you is when you have realized volatility, that's this white, blue, and gray, trading at a big premium to this red, which is implied volatility, Do you think that means premium selling is easy or hard and conditions are not as good for premium selling? Super hard. So you, but you may take in a lot more premium. So if you're in a condition where you take in a lot more premium than you normally would, what do you think you should do to your trade? One hedge, two, reduce your size, size down. Size down. 
One thing to think about from a risk perspective is don't try to hit home runs, singles and doubles. I'm sure you've heard that before. But if in a normal month you're trying to make $1,500 and then in a crazy month you should try to make $1,500. You get to use a lot less capital. So this is an interesting condition for things like short time spreads, short butterflies, things like that. And what about this? Look at this curvature. This is skew. I mean, they're basically begging you to do like a bearish broken wing butterfly or a one by two or, or uh, some sort of put spread. Right now, if you sell premium against a long, long IV, it could go higher and the market direction could reverse in a moment's notice. A solution? So one thing about selling premium and selling implied volatility, all right? Anybody heard the term buy low and sell high? So with volatility and IV, you actually want to buy high and sell higher and sell low and buy lower. You don't try and sell a bunch of premium. Generally, obviously there's exceptions. You don't go and sell premium, generally speaking, when IV is just rallying, 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 rallying. At least not, not in the traditional ways. You could try some more complex trades potentially. but not a standard put spread or call spread. You're gonna, you will get run over. All right, so now finally, let's talk about the trade plan. So you're gonna set a maximum loss for each trade. This is the level, all right, that where the trade is pulled. You're gonna set an absolute max loss. And this is a level that a trade would never be able to fall to under any reasonable scenario. All right? So you set your absolute max loss to an August situation. You set your max loss for kind of last week where the, the sell-off was a little slower. Still ugly, but slower. For a condor, the maximum loss might be the same as the target profit. And the absolute max loss might be the, how much cash you took in. Something like that. And why do, you, why do I, you know, I'm probably the only person that talks about this. Why do we do that? Why do we set an absolute max loss? And it goes all the way back to trading, being able to trade. One of the hardest things for traders to deal with is when a trade is down but not at a maximum loss. Typically, I'll see them just sit on it. And what you should do is do some sort of adjustment, all right, or get out. If an absolute max loss is within one standard deviation, a one one-day standard deviation, you got to do something. It'll save you a lot of money. All right, so now let's talk about a couple of quick keys to adjusting. For every trade, there is likely some variant of adjustment that is going to work. However, there's some important keys to adjusting that will help ensure you don't blow up. I've seen more people blow up from bad adjustments than actually bad trades. And then, again, always close those cheap shorts. Always. ABC. You remember ABC?
If you haven't seen this. All right, we'll get through this Verizon commercial first. Switch to Sprint and save 50% on Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile rates. So start the new year off right and switch today. Sit. Have I got your attention now? Good. Because we're adding a little Black El Dorado. Anybody want to see second prize? Did you get the picture? Just to sell them. You can't close the lead you're given. You can't close. Mitch and Murray paid good money. Get their names to sell them. You can't close the lead you're given. You can't close shit. You are shit. Hit the bricks, pal, and beat it because you are going out. The leads are weak. The leads are weak. The fucking leads are weak. Oh, jeez. I don't know. To sign on the line which is dotted. You hear me, you fucking... Here we go. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. Closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. One more time, guys. Be closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. All right. Now, I probably wouldn't use some of the same language. All right. And, but I would want to use that same forcefulness. When I, when I train traders and they don't close stuff, I am a, get about that angry. All right. I, there, I have famously told off a student who went on vacation and didn't close a bunch of trades and cost themselves 100000 bucks. I just ripped into him. <laughs> I'm famous for my daintiness. Yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, I will. So, <laughs> so I want to talk about the third, third, third rule. So when you are at a third of a max loss, make an adjustment to reduce risk. When you're at two thirds, make an adjustment. And when you're at three thirds, make it adjust, close it. This is a simple way to manage trades. And I'm going to talk about how to blow up. And this is where people blow up. Never throw capital at a trade. All right. The idea, and this is the example. All right. I've watched somebody add butterflies, add butterflies, add butterflies until a trade that started with 15,000 bucks at risk had a hundred thousand dollars at risk. And they were down 40. And then they came to me. All right. Rolling and increasing the size is the quickest way to blow out. Unless you are a bottomless pit of capital, no trade. No trade adjustment, this is important. No trade adjustment should add risk. It should just take it off. So if you are one of these people that keeps adding and adding and adding, your day is coming. All right, so keep return targets and max losses off of the original trade. So if you add capital trade, do not add the adjustment capital to your maximum loss. And always try to stay contract neutral. What does that mean? Don't be net short contracts. And don't open up cheap options. Don't just sell a dime option because you can. That's an example of a bad adjustment. All right, so now let's talk about what we do in our strategy letter, and this is what our method is differently. So as a trader becomes more or less short premium, the trader is willing to accept less edge the other side. So if I've done, if I'm long a lot of premium, so I bought a strangle and a straddle or, uh, you know, or, and some calendars, well, now I'm, I'm actively looking 
for trades to sell. All right, so let's say I did an iron condor, and then I did a iron butterfly, and then I did another iron butterfly somewhere else. Well, my next trade, I should probably be try, try to find something I can buy that has edge in it. And the idea is that Greeks offset each other. All right, so in August, for instance, you know, in August of uh, last year, our strategy letter did not make money. But guess what? It did not lose money. And if it makes money the rest of the time, that is a happy, happy scenario. And that's really the best. If you can, if you can make money in normal times and give up a little of that, to make sure that when August happens, you don't get you don't get beat. That is the way to the promised land, folks, and that's the part people miss. You offset your Greeks. So if you're short a lot of Vega, short a lot of premium, short a lot of gamma, you have to find something to buy. So now. You know, when I was a market maker, you didn't have, you don't have trades coming to you like I did as a market maker, but you have an edge in your ability to, to, to trade. So every option should have a perceived edge in it. Right, these options are too cheap. I'm going to buy them. These options are too expensive. I'm going to sell them. Each successive trade should be better than the last trade. A trader that is short a lot of premium, you need a lot of perceived edge. It needs to be a home run to sell anymore. And then also ladder higher. Your very first trade, so if at, at most you're willing to put, you know, most of my guys, we tell them, uh, don't put any more than 5% in any one of your, uh, your portfolio in any one trade. All right. And actually, with your very first trade, if you have nothing on, your first trade should be, you know, one and a half to two percent. And then as you build a portfolio, you can increase in size. So the nice thing is that, you know, you should cap at five percent. That's unlike professional market making. So as the trader builds Greeks, you're actively looking for the other side. So I'm long a lot of delta. I'm going to look for good trades that get me short delta. I'm long. Uh, I'm short a lot of volatility, a lot of vega. I'm going to look for trades that I think are good that are going to get me long vega, and so on. That is the approach to building profit. The best part is if you're good, you can make money on both sides. You know, you can be short an iron condor and long uh, and in one product and long a straddle another and make money on both. So if executed properly, the trader should be able to carry a net portfolio that has very little systemic risk. All right. You can't you, you've got every individual trade is going to have risk. What you want to do is try to write out the risk associated with um, the risk associated with kind of the balance of your trades. If you can limit the risk to company risk and away from systemic risk, trading for edge will be profitable. And then you obviously need to learn how to find edge. Things to remember, you need to learn how to capture edge. So find good trades. You need to learn how to weight your grapes. Use capital weighting and beta weighting. Right? A 10 lot in the SPX is not the same as a 10 lot in SPY. you got to remember that. Every trade should be about the same amount of capital intensity, give or take. Get Fight for low commissions. I work with my students to, to fight for low commissions. And it this approach requires a slightly, slightly more active approach. It, it's not, it doesn't have to be a job, but you need to be able to get in front of your computer in the morning and the afternoon. And it requires that strong understanding of option fundamentals. 
So the most important thing, gamma and beta are the most important Greeks to monitor in any approach. Theta and delta will handle themselves. You need to be aware of how the Greeks change with underlying prices and volatility. A balanced portfolio can change on you, and you need to understand how your portfolio changes with risk metrics. So if volatility explodes, what happens to your position? So in the end, our method puts on good trades for edge, has a portfolio that takes on the risk, takes on risk, look for good trades that take the other side. It manages treat each trade on its own, but it has tight risk control, and it manages the portfolio Greeks, and ABC, it's always closing. So the benefit is you'll sleep at night, you'll have lower, a, a far better risk-adjusted return, your risk will be lower, your trade duration will be shorter, you'll likely be profitable, and you can be wrong a lot. Certainly on, on, the, uh, on the macro. So a sample portfolio, you might be short $20,000 in short premium trades. You might be long $5,000 worth of long premium trades. You might have a couple thousand bucks in vol stuff like VIX, VXX, and UVXY. You might put a bunch of a couple money in some pure directional plays, and you might keep twelve thousand in cash. So is there a rule for maximum portfolio deltas within a portfolio or is it dependent on the size of the portfolio? If the latter, is there any way to determine the maximum deltas independently of the size? Um, you know, it really depends on what you have. But really, what I would say is that you don't want delta, the way to think about it is you don't want delta to be the determining factor on whether you make money. And that's how it should be managed. What kind of back spreads do I do? I do all kinds of different types of back spreads and straddles. I mean, our, our, our portfolio of trades that we use at Option Pit is about 25 deep. And again, trades should generally be about the same size in terms of, uh, uh, they should not account for more than 5% of total capital at risk. And thus, for a $40,000 portfolio, trades should tie up about 1000 or 2000 bucks in margin. Absolute home runs, surefire trades, may use a little more than 5%. Never, never more than 10% of your capital at risk in one trade, ever. And the first trade in portfolio should lean small, not big, as stated earlier. If one has a butterfly on, remember the next butterfly should be better, not worse. And if one has done an offsetting trade, so if I short a butterfly, then I buy a straddle, well then, um, you know, then I can do a little more. So there's your summary. Now, what do we got going on? Well, Saturday the 23rd, if you like this, all right, and if you learn something, well, you're going to love this. So on Saturday the 23rd of January, we're going to be hosting a, our next special Saturday class. And this is a four-plus-hour class starting at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. And we're going to teach you adjust. It's called adjustment, Adjusting Positions and Managing Risk. And we're going to talk about how to adjust individual spreads, credit spreads, condors, flies, calendars, you name it. I'm going to teach you how to evaluate all the options and pick the one that is the, and that is the most capital efficient. All right. I'm going to teach you ways to maximize the effectiveness of adjusting trades. I'm going to teach you how to manage risk like a professional, and that includes portfolio delta management, delta hedging as on, across a portfolio, 
um, you know, we'll delve into that whole portfolio piece for an extended period of time. Members get it for free. So if you are a gold member, it's free. If you are an Option Pit Live subscriber, for 125 bucks a month, it's free. Now this course on its own is $247. Today, we're doing it for 147. And if you use code 25 underscore off, and it is case sensitive, 25 underscore off, I'll take an extra 25 bucks off by Wednesday. So $122 for this class and people love it when we do these. But let's say that you say, hey, you know what? I want the strategy letter and I want to get access to Mark and Andrew all the time. Well then, and or I know that I want a real education along with this. Well then, talk to us about being a gold member or talk to us about an option fit live subscription. And guess what? These are free with those. And we do one of these a month. So if you buy a gold membership for $1,500, you get $1,000 in Saturday classes for free. Can trades be done in IRA? Yes. At least right now. All right, any questions about the class? So you go to optionpit.com slash risk to sign up. Yes, if you sign up for the class, the class will be recorded and you will get to, wa to watch it. The discount ends Wednesday. It will be recorded. You will have access to it for life. Or at least as long as Option Pit is around. And today, gold membership is fifteen hundred dollars for four months of access. And if you have interest, give me a call about it. And actually, if you're a gold member, you get all of our old Saturday classes for free. UVXY went up on the close Friday. Your comment. Yeah, they bid up VIX futures aggressively. Uh, I think there's some serious risk. UVXY is ba based on VIX futures. You're aware of that, correct? So if you want to know what's going on with UVXY, all you have to do is pull up the VIX futures. And it's levered. And VIX are backward. VIX futures are backward right now, which means UVXY makes money every day, as opposed to losing money every day. All right. Any other questions? All right. Um, I think it could it will be different than August, but I'm not sure if worse is worse is right. And do I think markets could crash on Monday? If they're going to crash, it's going to be Monday probably. I don't know though. If I knew that, I wouldn't be here. I'd be sitting on my island. And yes, this will be posted on. So I'm going to push an email out with the with this offer. And in the middle of the page will be um, will be this webinar. 